So, uh, hi everyone. Um, I hope you're you're still awake uh, after the, the day. Um, there's going to be the, the lightning talks next, so so that will be perhaps a little bit more refreshing. But I'll try to make this this interesting as well. So um, I'm going to talk about jackrabbits uh, and and, and uh, content repository concept in general. This is more of a uh, introductory talk. Um, uh, some of you were, were in my earlier talk about the kind of architecture for, for Jackrabbit 3. Um, in this talk, I'll get kind of step back a little bit and, and, and start with by explaining how a content repository works and, and what you can do with it uh, instead of going into the deep implementation details or the architectural uh, complexities. So um, while I put the, the outline of this talk uh, up, I'll give a kind of a brief history of Jackrabbit. Um, Jackrabbit was, was started already uh, 12 years ago. Uh, it came to the Apache at, at a pretty early stage uh, through the incubator um, and graduated in 2005. And, and since then, we've been working on it um, all, all the time. Uh, it's currently at, at 2.7 is, is the latest uh, release. Uh, 2.8 is going to be out in, 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 in about a month or so. Um, and then we're targeting uh, Jackrabbit 3 uh, later this year uh, with the new Oak stuff that I mentioned. Um, but basically, it's a fairly mature project by now. Um, it's been used, used um, quite widely in the, um, in the content management space um, uh, and, and, and also in, in, in all sorts of kind of document management and, and kind of document tracking uh, uh, applications. Uh, and I'll go kind of through uh, and explain how, how this kind of um, hierarchical database fits those use cases pretty well. So uh, let's start with the simple stuff. Uh, just kind of, I'll describe uh, the repository model, what a content repository really is and how, it, how it's put together. So um, it's basically, um, a database, you could think of it as a special kind of a database. Uh, what you have um, in the repository, it's organized in different workspaces. Um, and then there's this special area called JCR system that's kind of a shared global uh, space that, that's kind of common to all of the workspaces. Uh, and the workspaces, like you could, you could use them to put like, here's my one application, it goes to this workspace, and here's my other application, it goes to that workspace and they're, they're apart from the shared stuff in JCR system that we'll cover later on, uh, they're pretty much independent of each other. Um, more commonly though, um, the workspaces aren't used that much uh, since uh, within a single workspace it, it's, it's very easy to kind of split uh, content to that area and then, then that content to that area. So a more common uh, deployment scenario is to have just one workspace. But you can do either way. Um, you always need just at least one workspace because that, that's where your content is going to stay. So um, within a single workspace then, uh, content is organized into nodes. Um, and they're organized in a, in a tree structure, a little bit more like you'd have in a, in a file system. Though there's no distinction between files and folders as such. It's just nodes, um, and each node then uh, can contain properties and child nodes. But, but basically, the, the, the key uh, three hierarchy is, is expressed as nodes. Um, and, and basically, uh, the way this works is, is that we started with the root node, and then each child uh, has a unique name within, within its parent. Uh, it, it's, um, in, in certain cases, it's possible to have two nodes with the same name. But I'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, and then kind of you, you follow, follow the name, uh, and then you get a node whose path uh, is, is slash A. And then if you follow uh, from that to, to child node B, you get a node whose path is slash A slash B. So basically, like, you can get to, to each node by following its path. And here's how the JCR system stuff um, comes in. It's, in a way, mounted to each workspace within a repository. So all of the workspaces see the same content within that area. And uh, we'll get back to that, back to it later, like, like to explain how that can be used for, for certain uh, cross-workspace operations. 
Um, and then kind of within a single node, um, you have properties and then you have the list of child nodes that that, that node contains. And here's just a simple example. Um, we'll go deeper into these types and so, so on. But for example, I have here a, a node that has um, a title and author property. Uh, so I've created a node that, that, that's titled my new node. Um, I made it an unstructured node. These are internal properties uh, that I'll explain a little bit later. But basically the idea is that you can have different types of properties. Strings are pretty common. We'll go through the property types soon. And then there's um, a list of, of, of child nodes. Um, they're uh, typically they're ordered, so you can kind of specify which is the order of the child nodes. But in some um, some cases, you can kind of allow the repository to to, to reorder those nodes for for better performance. Um, it's 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 something that you're in control of. So if you want to keep the order of the nodes, then you can. Um, if you don't care about it, uh, you can leave leave that unspecified, and it may have some performance benefits. And here's the kind of a, the special case that I mentioned. Uh, in, in certain situations, depending on the type of the node, it's possible to, to have more than one child node with the same name. These are called same name siblings, and they're kind of distinguished by, by having a kind of a sequence number add, added to the node. So you can have like a path to this node slash bar one or bar two to access those nodes. But, um, what happens if you remove uh, this node or move it somewhere else, then this node becomes just bar without the suffix. So only when there are more than one uh, same name siblings, they get this suffix. Uh, and kind of if you remove one, then the suffixes will change and so on. So they're handled a little bit specifically. But that's something that's possible to do. Uh, and then the common case of, of doing that is, is for example, um, if you have, um, if you are importing XML with say, say uh, an XHTML document with, with multiple paragraphs in a sequence, you have each of the paragraphs as a separate nodes and then you just set a sequence number um, to organize that. Um, and in th th those cases, like having the order included in the child node list, this is important. So um, a little bit deeper into these uh, types that you can store. This is a little bit like, like in a, in a, basically in any database, you, you have a specific set of, of, of core data types that, that the database supports. And that's the same also with content repositories. Um, so strings are, are one of the, the simplest things. You can store basically any, any Java string in, 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 the, in a property. Um, there's no strict size limit to the strings, uh, but given the way that the Jackrabbit stores those strings, uh, you don't want to store like, like a string that, that's a megabyte in size within a string property, uh, because then accessing that node becomes uh, very inefficient. Um, instead, what you can do, you can have these binary properties where you can store any, any binary data you can also use it also to store, store strings and access strings. Uh, the repository will automatically convert uh, or encode the string in, in UTF-8 when, it, when it's uh, persisted and then translated it back, uh, back to a string when accessed. Um, and, and the benefit of using binaries is that, that binaries are stored a little bit separately. So, so kind of having a binary within a node, regardless of how big it is, even if it's like, like gigabytes in size, it doesn't affect the performance of accessing that node. I'll talk a little bit about the binary special case later on. Then there's uh, kind of you can store names and paths. They are a little bit uh, differently handled than than plain strings. I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, it's related to these these uh, prefixes here that are separated by columns. Uh, just here has this concept of of, of namespaces. Um, and then basically it allows like uh, us to avoid naming conflicts. And that's why we, we treat those as a special data types. And then some very basic scalar data types. There are um, timestamps. Um, it's called a date, but it really is, is a millisecond level timestamp. If you want to store just 
uh, they just store the date with uh, noon or midnight uh, as the timestamp, or then just store it as, as a string. Uh, there's a reference type. Um, I'll go into more detail about that uh, in a moment. And then a whole lot of other types. Uh, there's a separate uh, property type for, for storing URLs. Uh, uh, there's a separate type for the storing uh, decimal values for, for, for financial data and so on. But those are fairly uh, infrequently used. So, so these are the, the main ones that you uh, run into to quite often. Besides having a single value like this, a property can also be multi-valued. It's essentially an array uh, ordered uh, sequence of, of values of that specific type. So you could have a multi-valued property of type string, or you could have a multi-valued property of type date. You can't have like a property that has strings and dates uh, interleaved. Uh, if you want to do that, then you need to convert uh, everything to a string or something like that. Um, Unlike uh, an array, uh, there's no null value, so it's kind of a special case. You can store a Java array with a null value or a Java list with a null, null value into a multi-valued property, but the repository will automatically throw away all the nulls and you kind of just compact the array. So <clears throat> that's a kind of a thing to, to remember. There, there's no error when you to do that. So, um, Node types, they're a little bit more, more complicated than property types. Uh, this kind of a node is, is more complex. It, it can contain any number of properties and any number of child nodes. Um, and, uh, and then basically the content repository allows you to have like either a very strict schema that specifies, okay, these nodes always have to contain these properties and these child nodes. And if you don't do that, then the repository uh, will, will, will complain and not allow you to save content that's, that breaks these, these rules. Or you can have content that, that's uh, kind of very unstructured and very flexible so that kind of the repository just, okay, you added an node with something there and I don't really care what, what there is. Um, there's a room or a place for, for both types of nodes. Uh, it, it depends on your application whether you want a very strict schema or a very, very relaxed one. But um, to make this stuff work, um, JCR uses the concept of node types, and there's this basic type uh, called NT-base, and that's the kind of um, the, 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 the root type of, of all other node types. And it specifies, I'm using this kind of uh, pseudo UML syntax uh, for specifying properties, so that any node, uh, Basically, since all node types are, are, are inherit from NT base, that means that all nodes uh, in the repository are expected to have uh, these properties. And these properties in turn are used to determine what is the type of that node. So you can have a JCR primary type uh, property or you have to have that property. As I showed in the, in the example above, there was this JCR primary type. And that tells the name of the node type uh, of which that node is. And the JCR mixing types, uh, it's a little bit, uh, it's an optional property, so it's, it, you don't have to have it, but you can uh, put a sequence of, 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 of additional types. They're called mixing types, they're a little bit like, like interfaces in, in Java, that you can have multiple of them uh, on, on any given, given uh, node. But there's only one primary type. So um, the most useful primary type um, you can't really make a node of, of, of NT base, or you can, but, but since it only allows these two properties, it's not a very useful node. Uh, you can't put any content. So uh, instead, the typical thing to start with is to use the NT unstructured type. And basically what it does, it allows that node, in addition to these, these uh, core properties that are inherited from, from NT base, it allows any properties of, of any type, any name, uh, whether they're multi-valued or not, uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, the repository won't complain since the NTL structure is just anything goes. Uh, and the same goes for child nodes. You can add any number of child nodes 
uh, including these same name siblings uh, to an empty unstructured uh, node. The only kind of bit of structure that there is is the fact that this node type is, is, is defined to, to keep the child node list in order, so you can specifically order, order uh, the child nodes. And uh, that's why uh, with the new version of, of kind of a Jackrabbit that we're working on in Oak, we're introducing this kind of separate Oak unstructured type that's otherwise the same as, as NT unstructured, but, but it allows the child nodes to be reordered at, at any time uh, by the repository, so you can't re rely on them remaining in the original order that you added them in. Um, then the mixing types uh, I mentioned, these are kind of stuff that you can add to any node uh, at well. You can also make a primary type uh, that instead of extending NT base or, or some other existing primary type, it can also uh, inherit stuff from, from these mixing types. They basically add some, some very tightly uh, specified additional or optional uh, features to a node. So we have this, this simplest uh, mixing type. It's called mix referenceable. It adds a UUID property to, to a node. Uh, and even though it is specified as a string property, there's uh, a built-in rule to these, these JC, uh, mixing, mix referenceable nodes. It, and that's that JCR UUID is automatically created by the repository. You don't need to set it yourself. Actually, you can't set it yourself except in, in some very specific cases. Um, and the repository enforces that within a workspace, there's only one node with a specific UUID. So they're unique within a workspace. Um, and that kind of um, is useful uh, for, for references as, as, um, as implied by the name of, of that node. I'll get to that a little bit later. Another common uh, mixing type that also has some special meaning to the re repository is mix versionable. Defines a whole lot of, of different properties. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later as well. But it basically makes it, it possible to kind of create new versions of that node and kind of have, ma have the repository maintain a version history of that node. So you can basically freeze the content of the node. Another kind of a special mixing type is, is mix lockable that makes it possible to, to apply uh, a synchronization lock on that node to prevent anyone else from, from modifying that, that, that content. And these are kind of, these are special mixing types in the sense that the repository has that special meaning to those. But you could also define your own mixing types with no special uh, semantics like that. Uh, for example, a common thing is, is to use these mixing types as, as additional labels that you can apply to any node. This kind of, any node can have any number of mixing types. Uh, for example, um, a, a common approach would be to define something like uh, mix um, um, annotations uh, that allows you to add extra annotations uh, to a node, for example. There's also like, like metadata-based uh, mixing types like mix language that allows you to specify the language in which the content uh, of, of that node uh, is. So, um, <clears throat> let's continue. There's a specific uh, case of, of, of predefined like uh, node types that, that kind of, that's used to, to simulate the behavior of a file system. That's called the NT hierarchy node uh, structure. Um, so, basically the, it allows you to kind of represent uh, data within the repository that looks uh, pretty much like it would in a file system. So you could have uh, folders that can have any, any other hierarchy nodes below it, but no other extra uh, uh, nodes. So you can't put an unstructured node within, within a folder or, or add, add a title property to a folder. It just has the name and then a list of, of a create date uh, from the NT hierarchy node and then a list of, of child nodes. Um, and um, in addition uh, to folders, you can have files. Uh, 
and uh, whereas a folder can contain any any number of of, of files or folders uh, as its children with with any node names, uh, the NT file is is, is structured so that uh, instead of having directly the binary content of the file as as a binary property of the node, um, we used specific NT resource node type um, and have it as a separate uh, JCR content child node. So what it looks like is that you have an NT file, parent node, and then below it another node that's typically an NT resource. And there you then have the binary property. The reason why that we kind of do it this way uh, instead of like having them in the same node is that, that you, can, you can have, for example, cases where you wanna, for example, have an image within a content management system and you want to have like thumbnails of that image attached to that file, then it's easy to, instead of just, just have that single blob, you could have multiple different versions of the file below that JCR content. That's a pretty powerful feature um, and quite useful in some cases. And as mentioned, you can define your own node types for your own applications, but uh, typically, when you start start uh, creating applications uh, using the NT event structure, it's a pretty good idea. Uh, it allows you to kind of get started quickly and not worry about the specific structure uh, until you know what your application will look like. So here's a simple example. Uh, I'm, I'm modeling a website uh, that has some uh, CSS files and images stored in the repository. Along with the site, there's some another folder with with the JavaScript file, uh, and then I have a se section of the site that, that's, that's a blog. Um, I'm just using entities that are structured here uh, for simplicity. Uh, and two posts, they might have title properties and content properties and so on. Uh, and here, uh, since NT unstructured can have anything under it, I could just, just add an attachment to that blog post by just adding an NT file um, node um, that contains that, that attachment binary. Or if I want to implement support for comments, I can just put the comments as extra child nodes there. So this is very flexible. You can make, mix and match uh, different types of content uh, quite easily uh, like this. So um, that's the basic structure of the repository. Then when you start accessing it, um, like instead of accessing the, the workspace directly, uh, you always go through a session. A session is, is basically like, like you're, you could, you could um, uh, think of it as, as a connection to, to a, a JDBC database. Uh, it's authenticated, uh, it, it keeps track of who you are, like who's the user who's currently accessing the session, and any unsafe changes uh, are kept uh, in the session. And you can basically have any number of sessions uh, uh, starting from, from, from one uh, when you open up a connection to, to the repository and, and, and create multiple sessions and mix and match those. Uh, and the sessions can, can often also be, be driven by, by applications like have just to kind of uh, keep a session open to track some, some stuff that's going on in the repository or make up automatic updates and so on. Um, as I mentioned, it basically uh, the purpose of these sessions is to track uh, access control information, who you are, and also the kind of transient changes that are not yet saved. Uh, an important thing to know uh, about sessions is that they are explicitly not thread safe. You don't want to use a single session from multiple threads at the same time. Uh, that's a very common uh, common problem. Uh, in, 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 in applications. So what we've done in Jackrabbit is that actually we have made the sessions thread safe uh, by just having a big lock on each session that prevents concurrent access. So it won't break anything. It just won't perform as well as you'd, you'd hope. A simple fix for that, if you want to have concurrent operations, uh, just use one thread per, uh, one session per thread. Um, and it'll perform a lot better than trying to to kind of uh, reuse the same session. Uh, creating new sessions is very, very cheap and efficient, so, so no need to worry about that. 
Another thing that I mentioned earlier is about the namespaces. That's a concept that's somewhat related to sessions. Uh, the repository has this, maintains this mapping of, 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 of prefix URI uh, pairs uh, that, that express the different namespaces in use in that repository. There are some predefined ones, uh, and then you can add your own namespaces. A typical uh, thing to do is like if you have your own application and you don't want to ensure that, that the content created by that application will not conflict with, with some other application that's accessing the same workspace within the same repository, then you could create your own namespace and, and then prefix all of the, the content accesses with, with that prefix. Um, what you can do with namespaces in, for each session, you can override those mappings. So for example, I have in the repository namespace prefix pool maps to some some namespace, but then I'm trying to import content from an XML file where that pool prefix matches some other namespace. I can kind of mix and match uh, the mappings within that session. Uh, but that's kind of, in practice, it, it's, it's kind of proven to be more trouble than it's worth. Um, typically, it's a lot easier instead of using JCR session uh, remapping mechanism uh, to just kind of when you're reading the content from the XML file or wherever you get the content and then do the mapping explicitly at that point um, instead of letting, letting a repository take care of that. And that's actually something that, that in, in the old project that's gonna be uh, in Jackrabbit 3, uh, we have a pretty big uh, performance hit for the case if you do uh, remap your, your session local namespaces. So, so the implementation is heavily optimized for the case that, okay, the, the namespace mappings are exactly as, are, as they are stored in the repository. Basically, it allows uh, the implementation to use the, the strings, name strings that you, you pass to the repository as is without having to try to parse them and remap the prefixes and all that stuff. So, um, References I mentioned already a little bit earlier, and we briefly hit the mixed version of node type. So here's a little bit uh, deeper explanation of how they work. So uh, <clears throat> this is the simple, simple content structure we had earlier. Um, since you can add a mixing type to any node, let's do that. Make, let's make uh, that node referenceable. So that's basically uh, at the JCR level. It's it's. Uh, add mixing call on that node, and we just give it the mix referenceable uh, name as an argument. And what the repository will do then, it'll apply that node type or mixing type to that node and automatically generate a UUID that is then stored in the JCR UUID property. So far this is pretty simple, but now that this node is referenceable, uh, sorry, we can now start adding references to it. For example, we can put a reference property on this node that points to this UUID, like, like property C, that node uh, with UUID, uh, that, that's shown there. And, um, again, I'm going in the wrong direction. And we can put any number of references to a node. So that kind of allows us to do, in not just a strict hierarchy or tree hierarchy, we can do basically any types of graphs uh, in the repository. And these work fairly efficiently. Uh, you can follow the reference. Um, there's even a get node uh, call on the property. Like if it's a reference property, you can just do a get node on that property and it will follow the reference and give you the node uh, that, that is pointing, uh, that the reference is pointing to. Uh, and um, you can also do back references so from that referenceable node, you can ask what are all the, the, the properties that point to this node. So you can follow those back uh, to, the, to the locations or sources of the uh, references. Um, there are though some cases where, where this, uh, these references don't perform as well as the normal tree structure. Uh, those are mostly related to, to kind of maintaining the referential integrity. Uh, in operations like that, uh, also search operations aren't 
as efficient if you're following, uh, following references uh, in your search statements instead of if you're following the path structure. So it's kind of a, it's not a, not a pure graph database, like a generic graph database, but we do have some of those features that, that for those cases where the tree hierarchy isn't enough, references come in handy. And um, when I talk about references, uh, I, I kind of mostly mean these hard references that the repository enforces that kind of, if, if you have a reference pointing to a node, you can't remove that node before the reference is, is removed uh, or unless you remove that reference in the same transaction. Um, that kind of adds a little bit of overhead and it just kind of makes the content structure a little bit strict uh, and not so flexible. So um, in many cases, um, a better idea is to use these weaker forms of references. It's a little bit like, like having a URL uh, in a system versus having a strict link between two, two, uh, two resources. Um, the URLs make, make the, the, the system more and more flexible since you don't have to worry about uh, the references uh, that might be there somewhere else. So you can do a weak reference that works just like a reference that uses the same UUIDs. You can do uh, follow the reference, you can do a back reference on it. Um, it just might be broken. So kind of when you follow a weak reference, you might get an error that, okay, the target actually doesn't exist. And since the nodes are also uh, identifiable by their path, you could store a path of a node uh, in, a, in a property and use that as a reference to it. Or you could use, if you know like where within the content tree this, this uh, reference node exists, you could use just this name. Uh, or you could use a URL that points uh, to, to a website where the node is, is uh, located or something like that. So these are the kind of uh, most flexible types of references. Uh, but, but then again, you can't kind of follow that uh, uh, reference back without the certs uh, that, that's more it, it's still fairly fast, but it's not as efficient as just doing a, like a normal hard or, or weak reference. A common uh, way of using especially names as references in this case is to use, um, for example, if you have a tagging system, uh, you could have like your tags defined in a separate uh, location within the repository. And you could just, just add a property that contains the name or multiple uh, multi-value property with the names of the tags that apply to that node. Uh, and such a system is, is kind of typically, um, it's easier to manage such a system when, when the, the tag references aren't hard uh, because then the, the tags become more, more efficient to access and it doesn't matter if, if kind of, okay, I want to get rid of this tag and I don't really worry about if, if there still are, are some pieces of content that still reference this tag. I'll just clean them up uh, when I get around to it. Um, references are related to versioning uh, quite tightly. So um, I'll just show um, how to make a node versionable like we just did with uh, referenceable here. So again, I add a mixing type and then makes the node referenceable. That's uh, a bunch of, of, of internal properties um, and causes the repository to create a new version history. And this node goes into the JCR system subtree. So it's shared by all the workspaces. So basically, the, if, you do, if you do have a version history, you can kind of share that across the workspace. And that's used to kind of, for example, you can push a different version of a node to a different workspace. Um, and for example, a typical way of, of handling using this feature is to have this kind of uh, staging publish um, uh, system where you would use one, one workspace to edit content and then when you see that, okay, now it's ready to be published, you create a new version and push that version to the separate publish workspace. That allows you to keep editing your content and then just selectively uh, push stuff out uh, to be visible to, to other users. Um, and when we do that, uh, we, the system automatically adds a reference to the version history, so you can find the version history within JCR system. Um, 
and then when we check in, uh, create a new version of, of that node, then uh, what happens is that we take that node and all the non-versionable tile nodes of it and create a copy of that subtree in the version history. Now, if this node was separately versionable, then the copy would only contain this and this node. Um, so kind of you can decide that how much of the content is going to be copied over, uh, copied over uh, as a part of the version. But typically, a common uh, approach to, to using this versionable thing is, is to define, for example, a document node or a page node or something like that as versionable. And then any kind of comments and, and, and attachments of that node are going to be included in each version of that, that is created. And this, this check-in operation, it's, it's basically a copy, uh, copy by reference. So, so actually we don't create a whole lot of extra or end up using a whole lot of extra disk space. Uh, we just keep a reference uh, to the content. And if this then gets modified, then we only create a new, new copy. So, so it's fairly efficient. Um, there are a couple of, of versioning operations. Uh, as I mentioned, check-in creates this new, new node. Uh, another feature of, of the check-in is that it, it kind of marks the node that was, was checked in as read-only. So unless you explicitly check it out with the checkout operation, uh, you can't modify it. Uh, the reasons for that are a little bit complex, but it kind of dates back to to earlier version control systems and the way uh, web dev versioning works and so on. Uh, but basically, like when you check in, uh, the node becomes uh, read-only, and then you check out, you can make your changes, and then you check in again and create a new version, and then, then kind of until you check it out again, it remains uh, um, read-only. Uh, the restore operation allows you to kind of take a specific version and figure out that, okay, now I've done something stupid. I want to go back in time and, and restore that, that or older version. Uh, and merge uh, allows you to use, like, um, uh, if you have uh, basically different versions of the same node in different workspaces, like you can do since the version history is shared, um, you could have both nodes uh, uh, modified in, in different ways uh, and created new versions and then the kind of version history will diverge. You can use the merge operation to then kind of combine those changes. But that's a fairly advanced operation and I haven't really seen that used that much in practice. Uh, so, but it's possible. Actually, the, the functionality in the versioning part is pretty advanced. Uh, it's based on the WebDAV uh, Delta V versioning model. So you can do quite a lot of stuff with it. Um, then perhaps the, the most useful specific features of, of, of the content repository is the search functionality. Um, like any database, it, it supports search. Um, and this is kind of, the search functionality in, in the content repository isn't um, as good as you could typically get from, from, from a relational database. You, you can't do very, very good joins and stuff. But there are some features that make it very, very useful. Uh, one thing is that it, it understands this uh, tree structure. Uh, so kind of you can search within that area, regardless of the types of the node there. Um, and it also supports full text out of the box. So you don't have to do anything extra to, to make your, your content full text searchable. So the, the, there were just a couple of examples. We support both this kind of SQL-like dialect. Um, we have to use this, this funky uh, quoting to, to quote the, the columns used for, for the namespace prefixes. Uh, and then, then uh, there's support for XPath. Um, and then the functionality in both, both uh, query languages is essentially the same. So you could express the same query in either way. This is kind of a matter of, of preference uh, and kind of what, what fits the specific need better. If you're doing queries by the tree hierarchy, then the next path is likely more, more, more useful um, than, than the SQL uh, dialect. 
but if you're just just worried kind of doing doing searches by a property then then the SQL one is just might be uh, more 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 natural for that and the repository will by default like at least the jackrabbit implementation will by default index all your content like all the properties in all the nodes uh, including all binaries uh, using automatic text extraction uh, for the binaries so you get a kind of a the entire repository is fully searchable. You can do full text queries against everything. Uh, it works pretty well. Uh, of course, uh, once you have a really big repository, uh, then the search index becomes pretty large. Um, and, 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 and at some point, almost unmanageable. Um, so then it's possible to customize the index and only specify, OK, I don't really care about those properties or I don't really care about that subtree. So um, don't index that. But by default, everything is indexed, which is really nice for just kind of throwing content there and then starting to use it. Um, as I mentioned, the join support isn't that great. Uh, we do now have a limited uh, join feature, um, and its performance has, has been improved by uh, a couple of orders of magnitude already, so it's not horribly bad, but it's nowhere near as, as what you'd get from a relational database. So, so it, the functionality is there, but but be a little bit careful if, if you want to use it, or at least benchmark your benchmark your queries to see what works best. Um, and unfortunately, there is no support for for faceting or aggregate queries, so you have to do those uh, on top of the top of the, the search functionality provided by the repository. That's something that we're planning to address uh, within the old project, but it, it's still not implemented, so we'll probably have to wait a little bit more for, for that. Um, observation is, is a little bit, um, well, it's not exactly like triggers in a relational database. It's more like an asynchronous um, listener that gets notified when something changes in the repository. You can register these listeners and then kind of get, get notified that, okay, I want to know when this specific property within an empty uh, unstructured node is changed, or I want to be notified whenever anything changes within this subtree, um, or so on. This is kind of a very fairly uh, detailed uh, way of specifying what you're really interested in. Um, typically, um, you'd use that to kind of maintain a cache, like, okay, there's some, for example, I'm rendering parts of a website, and then rendering that part will require kind of accessing lots of content within the repository, so I don't want to do it every time um, uh, the page is accessed, uh, so I maintain an in-memory cache for that, and then I need some way to invalidate those entries, and I add an observation listener uh, that gets notified when, whenever something within that area of the repository is changed, and then I know that okay, I, I need to need to kind of recall calculate that that entry in the cache. A kind of a tricky bit about these observers is that since they're bound to a given session, like you always need a session to, to register a listener, and uh, the, the events that get delivered to to that listener are are then kind of related to the status seen by the session, like, like the namespace mappings apply, and so on. Um, you'll need to be a little bit careful about what you do with the events, um, ensure that there's no other process that's concurrently accessing the session. So what, what typically um, people do with observation listeners is that they start a session, register an observation listener, and then just leave the session be um, and do nothing else with that specific session. So it's only used for processing the events from, from the listener. Um, and that way, since the, the repository guarantees that, the, that only a single thread will deliver events to a single listener at a the time, then, then there's no thread safety issue. Uh, but if you're kind of concurrently using that same session for something else, um, it's hard to guarantee that, that you don't do something, something uh, troublesome. Of course, as I mentioned, there is this, this fail-safe in Jackrabbit that pre prevents 
the internals from, from getting corrupted in some cases, but, but still it's good practice to, to keep that in mind. Um, another uh, pretty important feature is access control. And that's also like where the content repository um, signed uh, feature-wise um, when compared to, to other uh, databases and, and also many, many NoSQL databases. Uh, the access control model is, is pretty uh, complete. It's very fine-grained, it's based on access control lists. Uh, but instead of just being able to say, okay, I want this, these access controls to apply to this node, you can specify that they apply to this whole subtree, uh, which is something that is very, very difficult to apply um, in, in, in many other databases, like uh, selectively select a subset uh, of, of your content and apply a list on that and then have still other ACLs on, on parts of that subtree and so on. Um, so that's kind of a very, very detailed model. Um, it's a little bit similar to what you'd have in a file system where kind of these access controls are, are especially the more advanced file systems with ACL based, um, based uh, access controls. Um, they, they've been used to, to kind of implement some pretty, pretty complicated um, access control scenario. So, so this is a bit similar. Uh, it's a fairly powerful, pow powerful feature. And it also applies to all accesses. So um, when you search something, you get only the results that you're allowed to search. When you have an observation listener, it gets only, only notified of changes to content that you can see and so on. Uh, right access control is enforced during, during saves and so on. And you can also use this mechanism to, to, to implement your own custom uh, privileges or permissions. Um, they won't be interpreted by, by the repository. The repository won't tell that, okay, you can't do this. But it can, you can use kind of uh, specific methods to query the repository. Like, okay, I have this node. Can I do permission X on this node? And a typical example would it, for it would be like, like something like an execute privilege where you have some, for example, some scripts that you only want specific users to be able to access. Then you could define your own execute privilege on that. Um, and that would kind of, whenever you're trying to run this script, you'd ask the repository like, okay, given the currently applicable ACLs, does this user have the permission to execute this piece of content? That's a pretty powerful feature and it kind of can be used to, to do pretty cool stuff. Uh, then a few notes uh, before we um, close off uh, on, the, on the actual Jackrabbit implementation and the persistence options that you have there. This is more like very specific to, to Jackrabbit instead of just content repositories in general. Um, the way Jackrabbit stores uh, content, it uses these persistence managers uh, under each workspace and also separate one for the JCR system. And, and typically the persistence manager uses some external database for it. Uh, currently we mostly just do embedded and external relational databases. Um, there's also like limited support for storing stuff directly on the file system. It doesn't perform too well, it's more of a proof of concept. And uh, some people have done uh, like uh, MongoDB based uh, persistence managers and so on. Another thing is the data store. Um, that relates to the binaries. Um, uh, it's possible and currently it's the default that you can define a kind of a repository-wide data store uh, where all the binaries get stored. Uh, so if you have one binary in, in one workspace and the same, a copy of the same binary in another workspace, you don't duplicate uh, that bin binary. It only gets stored once in the data store. Um, and there we have a, lot of, a few more options on, on where to store the stuff. Uh, the S3 one is, 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 is quite useful for really big repositories. Um, and you can also use a local file system and, and the relational databases. Uh, there's also support for clustering, though currently that, that feature requires you to have a clustered uh, database backend and you need to have your persistence managers and data stores pointing uh, to that database uh, for this to work. But it does allow you to scale out uh, horizontally. 
in the Oak uh, project that's gonna be in Jackrabbit 3, we'll have a more native uh, clustering feature. Um, then uh, deployments, uh, configuration at the end, I'll go through this pretty fast. Um, we have a couple of kind of ready-made deployment packages. You can deploy Jackrabbit as a web app or, or a runnable jar or put it in that J2E container. Or you could just kind of embed it in, inside your own application and start it directly. Um, there's a couple of, of configuration files that you can use to control all these aspects. Um, won't have to go, have time to go into detail, but there's a website that's uh, fairly complete uh, about all the available options. So that's about it. I think our time is also running out. Uh, so if you have any questions, I could take a couple before we wrap up. Yeah. Uh, is there just still no native content browser? Yeah. Is that something you're planning for Oak? It's, it's something that has been in planning for, for a long time now. We actually have, um, have a commitment from my employer to, to kind of make it. I because I'm yeah. managing PQ. Yeah, so yeah. I was wondering if yeah. something like what is included in that is ever going to be definitely taken. It's, uh, yeah, uh, the, the old CRX Content Explorer is something that, that we have decided, that Adobe has decided to, to contribute. Okay. It's unfortunately been on the top or bottom of the priority list. So we haven't gotten around to it uh, yet. But it's definitely coming. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. So I, I wanted to yeah. ask about indexing. Yeah. So uh, you close your you know, data faster. Yeah. What we've typically done in, in, in such cases um, is to kind of enable the clustering mode and then kind of disable index updates on the live cluster nodes and add an extra node where we do the index updates entirely uh, and kind of let it run as long as it needs to run. And once it's done, we then copy the index, physically copy the index, physically copy the index files. Okay. So it's, it's Kind of a hacky solution, so, but it works. So if you're like running a, a master and a play yeah. for your authoring, yeah. you know, yeah. and you just push everything off to play and you just like share it, yeah. and then it's just physically copied. Yeah, yeah, and then it just restart the, the master node and it'll pick up the, the latest index. And, and then it's so. offloads about half the work. Yeah. <laughs> so. So it works, it's, it's not, not a very clean solution, but, but so far it's been enough to, since those are fairly rare cases when you do such, such stuff, so it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. If, if, if you start doing that more often, then, then, um, then I guess it, it well, well, the Oak project will have a solution for that as well. Uh, you can basically make the index updates be part of the commit that you do. So then it will only slow down the importing process. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so that'll, yeah. Mm, currently, uh, with log warnings about that. So, so if, if you have a case where you have two threads concurrently as accessing a session, we notice that it's happening, we prevent the concurrent access, and we log a warning about the situation. It even comes with stack traces of where your code is, is trying to do this, so it, it's pretty detailed. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, thank you.
Uh, yeah, um, I uploaded them them on the on the conference website, but they weren't accessible yet um, as of just before the the the, the presentation. So they they should be there. I think. That, that is for all the there's yeah. There's if you go to 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 the Diabaticon website on on the Linux Foundation, uh, there's like. Um, if you go to the, the menu, there's the program and everything. There's a separate page with slides, and it lists all the sessions that have slides already. Uh, so, so these slides will be there as well. I'll probably also put them on slides there and tweet the, the link. So, so if you find me on, on Twitter, uh, it's uh, uh, Yukkach um, on Twitter, then, then you'll find it from there as well.